Hi. So first of all, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, we've heard a lot this week at this conference on neural networks trained with deep learning. Clearly, they're the state of the art in AI. And they use floating point numbers, typically, to code neuronal activation levels and connection strengths. Whereas everybody knows that real neurons use spikes. Now, for many people, that's not a problem because the floating point numbers are supposed to represent the firing rate of neurons. And so we don't have to worry about the fact that real neurons use spikes, right? But I think that's wrong. Personally, there's a real problem with power. Floating point mass is extremely expensive. Rate coding as such is also a disaster, as I'll, I'll attempt to show. Backprop learning, typically, which is what people typically use, is also a disaster, very, very expensive to do. And so I'm going to be pushing the idea that we should be moving towards spiking systems uh, as being a best solution for the future. So let's just recap on a standard neural network approach where here we've got 16 neurons and they're all sending floating point numbers and then the this output neuron has a set of weights which are also floating point numbers we calculate the final activation by multiplying the weights and the activation levels and adding them all together and then putting that through some uh, output function now if if that was the way that the brain works there's a big problem because uh, if you say, well, we've got 86 billion neurons in the brain and there are 7,000 synapses per neuron, to calculate the brain state with one millisecond precision, a thousand times a second, would require 600 petaflops. Uh, and the most powerful computer on the planet, uh, supercomputer Fugaku in Japan, can only manage about 500 petaflops. Um, and it's using nearly 30 megawatts of power whereas the brain only uses 20 watts so 1.5 million times more energy efficient where does that advantage come from uh, well this week we've been hearing quite a lot about using in-memory computing and it's true that a lot of the energy required by these sort of supercomputers is moving data around so if you can get the the, the computations done where the memory is that's a, that can be a big advantage but i'm going to argue that using spikes is perhaps even more more significant now, as I say, the mainstream view is, that this, I would think that was shared by, you know, 99.9% .9 of all research is that spikes are essentially rep implementing rate coding. Uh, and, and that's how we convert spikes into floating point numbers. And there are several ways you can do this. You can use what I'd call standard rate coding, which is just to count the number of spikes in a fixed time, like 10 milliseconds. You can also use the interspike interval if you've got two spikes to, to estimate the, the instantaneous firing rate. You could, if you wanted to, use a population rate code where we count the spikes across a population of neurons in a fixed time. This could allow information to be transmitted more rapidly but costs a lot in terms of numbers of neurons. Uh, similarly, you could use potentially labeled line coding where you have neurons that code specific activation levels uh, but there again, you would need lots more neurons. And, and many people assume that actually what neurons do is to convert their activation levels into a Poisson rate code. Um, sort of, but that's uh, very noisy. So I will argue that all of these are actually very inefficient coding schemes. Um, just very briefly, I mean, the count-based coding is the idea that these neurons generate um, um, spikes at different rates, okay. Um, the interspike interval code um, uh, in, in the interval here, or population rate coding, rate coding or labeled line, or Poisson rate coding, all of these things have real problems because they're not very efficient. You need lots of spikes or lots of neurons to be able to send information. And the fact is, there's a perfectly good and simple um, alternative, which is using temporal coding. Here, it's the idea that uh, you process information using a wave of spikes. Here, we've got a, a series of neurons and an intensity profile, and those uh, the, the most act strongly activated neurons fire first, allowing you to code information in the order of firing of the neurons. And this follows from a very simple uh, bit of neurophysiology. A sensory neuron is effectively like a a capacitor with a threshold. If you've got a weak stimulus, it takes a certain time to get the neuron to get to uh, to reach the, the threshold to spike. If you increase the intensity of stimulus, uh, it will fire with a short, shorter and shorter latency. 
And you get this sort of intensity latency function as intensity increases, the latency drops. Uh, and so effectively, neurons are intensity de to delay converters, which is very different to the conventional view of neurons as intensity to rate converters. Actually, you can see in this, this thing here that it, it effectively does both, even if you're using rate coding. But the, the, the important thing is here is that you don't need all, to look at all these other spikes here because you already know the, the, uh, the intensity by looking at the latency of the first spike. And in fact, the weird thing is that this has been known since the very birth of, uh, of neurophysiology. Uh, Lord uh, Edgar Adrian um, in, at the University of Cambridge in the 1920s, he got the Nobel Prize for this, was recording from sensory fibres. Uh, and uh, there's this paper here where he recorded fibres in the eel optic nerve to um, light uh, presented uh, spots of light at different intensities, uh, high intensity, low intensity. The stimulus comes on for three seconds and he's measuring the firing rate of a bunch of fibres. And you can see with the higher intensity stimulus, you get a higher firing rate here uh, than with the lower intensity stim stimulus. And indeed, the maintained firing rate is even more different. But the really critical thing is, look here, the latency of the onset is completely different. It's much shorter when you have a high intensity stimulus to a low intensity stimulus. In other words, the retina here is an intensity delay content converter, and that basic physiological fact was essentially ignored for over 60 years. Um, now, back in the 1990s with my student uh, Jacques Gautre, we, we were looking at um, how you might convert an in input intensity profile into a, a wave of spikes here and then try and decode using just the ordering of spikes. And you can do this by having a neuron here with different weights um, for the different inputs, but we add in a desensitizing inhibitory circuit, this, this shunting inhibition circuit, Will, will reduce the sensitivity of this neuron as spikes come in. So every time a spike comes in, you make this less sensitive, such that the best way to activate the cell is to hit the, first, the biggest synapse first, then the second one, and so on. So you know, uh, we're using a modulation function of 0.85. Every time a spike comes in, you, re you reduce, uh, you modulate the sensitivity. And this allows you to produce these sort of graphs here. But this is as spikes come in. If they arrive in alphabetical order here, you get the maximum level of activation. If you find the reverse alphabetical order, you get the minimum activation, and then um, other orders will produce something in between the two. Now, it turns out that um, the <laughs> even with 16 inputs, the number of orders that you can have, 16 factorial, is you know, nearly 21 trillion different orders. So, you know, in principle, you can have 21 trillion order, uh, neurons, each coding a different order. But it's um, that's really overkill, and it re would require very accurate synaptic weight control. <clears throat> More to a, a, a bigger problem for us was that we never managed to come up with a a reasonable biological rule to fix the weights according to the order of firing of the inputs. What tended to happen was that the, the, the weights ended up either being fully on or fully off, in other words, binary weights. And so subsequently we were looking for ways of doing um, coding and decoding with just uh, binary connections. And this led us to the idea of N of M coding, where in fact well, we have here uh, a stimulus to, um, which is generating different uh, an activity profile using the intensity to latency conversion trick. Most active neurons firing first, generating this sequence of spikes. And um, the idea is that we add in some relay cells here with a, an inhibitory circuit which counts the number of neurons that are fired and then blocks um, um, uh, any further spikes once a certain number have gone through. So the first four spikes here get through and then the inhibition turns off the other ones. So these relay cells are coupled with a, a what you could call a temporal winner-take-all circuit. Um, and it only allows the first N spikes out of M to go through. You can actually do the same thing with the inhibitory circuit directly connected to the in input neurons, and, and that has an advantage because all these spikes here never actually occur at all, which is a, immediately a saving in energy. Um, now, um, 
this uh, we call this n of uh, uh, n of m coding because you choose n spikes out of your set of n m neurons on the input. It turns out that we use that sort of coding. Um, we developed it at SpikeNet Technology, uh, the company I set up in 1999. Uh, we developed this in around 2001 to 4, but we never published it because it was the secret source of the company's um, success, if you like. It turned out, though, that um, Steve Ferber, the guy who is behind the Spinnaker project, uh, came up with a, effectively the same sort of idea, N of M coding, in 2004. But this was independently developed. So the idea is that you've got this, um, uh, this set of N spikes going through, and then we, have, uh, we add in neurons with a fixed number of binary weights. So here we've got four weights every time. And uh, with M16 and N equal four, and with four binary weights, you can calculate the distribution with random inputs of different numbers of matches. So 27% of the time you, you get no activation. Most of the time you get one activation, as you can see here. Occasionally you get two. Uh, getting four would be very unlikely. Now, um, what that means though is it, these, here we've got a neuron which um, we've wired it up so it actually responds perfectly uh, to uh, uh, this input profile because J, K, C and B fire first. And then here is another set of, uh, of spikes so we can, we can, we can uh, decode the ordering by looking at the first neurons to fire. Um, note that here, for instance, this, uh, this neuron here uh, will respond well to KMAO, but also to MAKO or uh, MAMOK. Effectively, it doesn't know what order those first neurons fired, it just knows that the first neurons to fire were those four. Now, um, this is, we, I've been talking about a very simple case with just 16 inputs and four spikes and four weights. But if we, we can calculate using the hypergeometric distribution the probability of different numbers of hits, uh, this is the case that we've looked at already, where actually 0.05% of the time you get four hits by chance. But if you increase M, if you, create, if you increase the number of input neurons to say 64, the probability of getting four hits by chance. Um, drops to extremely low level. Um, you can do the same thing um, by fixing the percentage of active neurons. Here we can go up to, let's say, um, uh, with 100 inputs, 10 N of 10 and 10 weights, it turns out that there, even if your threshold, the neuron threshold is only, is only 7 and not 10, there's a very, very low chance of getting a random input hitting um, more than seven uh, of the synapses. It's simply, you know, imagine a hat with with a hundred balls in them. Ten of them are white. Put your hand in, pull out ten at random, and count how many white ones are. Well, you can you can understand why getting ten white ones by chance is just not going to happen. Now, um, what that means is you can use this this trick to allow the development of extremely selective neurons that are extremely unlikely to fire with random inputs. The neurons will pick, will detect a particular coincidence between the inputs. Now, um, I've just shown you a neuron here that, that's good at detecting that particular set of four spikes coming in first. The question is, how might you learn or train a system to, to respond to a pattern that repeats? Well, Back in, 19, in 2016, with my colleagues, Jake Martin, Amir Youssef Sadi, and myself, and Tim Maschielli, we came up with a learning rule, which we called JAST, uh, for obvious reasons. And what JAST does is, you, have, um, you start with random connections, but your neurons have two thresholds. You have a th firing threshold, which might be four, uh, but a lower threshold for learning. So, and the idea is that if you reach the learning threshold, um, you will move an unused weight to an activated input. So, for instance, here we might um, take this weight and move it um, uh, to this active input, such that now, if you repeat the same pattern on the input, you get three hits rather than two. And let's suppose that your learning threshold is now three. We'll do the same trick again. You would take the, an unused weight and move it to the 
to the uh, to an activated one. And so, you know, in two repetitions, we've now got a neuron which responds selectively to this pattern, which is repeated. Um, you know, now we've got a detector uh, any any sequence that has B, C, J, K in the first four inputs. Now. Um, that's a toy version, if you like, but, um, but even in 2015, we, we, we were doing this with 1,024 input neurons and 1,024 output neurons. Initially, the, the, the neurons are firing just completely randomly, uh, and you can see that there are no spikes on the output at all. But then at some point, we arbitrarily do choose one of the spikes in the input as a sort of the, the seed for a, a motif which we're going to repeat. And we take one in every two spikes, here they're covered, colored in blue, uh, and we're going to repeat that motif uh, several times. Now, the first time um, that motif occurs, well, it's the same as the background activity, so there are no spikes in the output. But look, here's the second presentation a bit later on. We've got the same blue spikes on a, on, uh, uh, on a background of noise spikes. And look, uh, we've got two neurons here in the, output, in the outputs which are already firing a spike. And by the time we've had six repeats of the pattern, we've got a whole string of neurons firing. And in fact, we can, we can um, simultaneously train uh, neurons to respond to the, several different motifs. We've got a, a red motif and a blue one here, and, and both of them have, have produced learning. Now, the fact is that we were doing this, uh, this wasn't a simulation, it was being running on an FPGA, a field programmable gate array, um, um, the program by Amir. Uh, so just simple Spartan 6 implementation. Uh, this is the Spartan 6 in the center here. The spikes are coming in here and going, coming out here. But we've got this huge number of spikes, most of which is uh, a noise. And at the beginning, there are no, uh, fire, uh, no spikes. Here are the, the repeating motifs coming in, and you can see the neurons starting to learn to respond to those. Here we go back to noise, and the, the neurons don't fire anymore. And then we bring back in the pattern, and, uh, and you can see the, the neurons firing. Now, all of those... All of that stuff was done in 13 milliseconds on FPGA. It was very efficient uh, code, and we can do online learning with this. Now, we actually got a patent uh, submitted on, on, on that, and that patent uh, was, uh, the, uh, was we, we then signed a, a deal with Brainchip, the company making the Akita chip, um, uh, who have a, an exclusive license to use the JAS learning rule in their hardware. Um, and so the Akita chip uh, that they're bringing out at the moment should allow us to do this. Um, um, it, 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 they're, they're starting to deliver um, Raspberry Pi development boards with an Akita chip on it. So I'm looking forward to seeing how well it works. Uh, the, the maximum number of inputs to a neuron um, are 81,920. Um, so it should be able to use the JAST learning rule to pick up repeating patterns amongst those things. Um, although I'm not, it's not yet clear how many on-chip neurons you can do this with, uh, and that's clearly, uh, actually quite a critical um, point. So just to summarize, uh, what I've been trying to push is the idea that by, by using spiking neurons and intensity de delay coding on the input, you can get information in the order of firing and by using inhibitory circuits to control the percentage of active neurons and using binary synapses, um, we can do this N of M coding trick and we can use a, a JAST learning rule using binary weights to just move the weights around to match incoming patterns. And under those conditions, two to, three to five repeats is enough for neurons to learn to respond to a repeating pattern. So just to sort of uh, summarize where we got to here, <coughs> conventional neural networks use floating point numbers for the activation and, and for the weights. You could have an event-driven one um, where the spikes come in, but you're still using floating point numbers for the weights. But you can also, if you like, have event-driven with binary weights. Uh, and if you're using N of M coding to pick off the first N spikes, this gets very interesting here. Um, so the ones on the left, these are, by definition, expensive to do because they're using uh, floating point numbers for the synapses. And you essentially have to calculate all the synapses um, every time. Whereas here, it's much cheaper in principle because, in fact, 
um, these neurons here, every time a spike comes in, you just have to increment the activation level. And with the N of M coding, you can really control the sparsity and you can use this JAS learning rule. So the question is, can we scale those ideas up to uh, bigger things? Um, and this is why I like to talk about the TerraBrain project, which is an idea that I'm working on with colleagues at the IRIT uh, lab in Toulouse. Um, actually, we, um, with Dominique Langin, we have another project involving Andreas Erzig and Emiliano uh, Lorini, uh, where we want to use spiking neural networks for doing things like controlling action and logical reasoning and so on. But uh, for the moment, uh, I'm going to talk about what we've been doing with these, these guys here from the STORM team. They're, they're, they're experts in graphic processing, graph, uh, GPU processing. And we're, what we've been looking at is whether we can we can simulate very large networks of spiking neural networks actually using existing computing hardware. So <clears throat> the basic idea is that, you know, if we want to do reasoning, for instance, it's a bit like when you ask a question like, which composer born in 1756, you might have in a, a quiz show, somebody buzzing in and saying, oh, Mozart. Well, you could do that in a, in a pretty simple spiking neural network model where uh, inputs correspond to things like composer, birth, 1756. And if you hit the three things at the same time, you might get a spike from the Mozart neuron uh, to do this. Now, that's a very simple thing with 16 inputs, 16 outputs. Can we scale that up? Can we have you know, big networks with including recurrent connections and motor control using only binary connections, fixed numbers of connections per output? Note that every input can have arbitrarily large numbers of connections. And in fact, you can have any architecture you like with this. The, the key thing is that it's ultra sparse connectivity and activity. And so can we do billions of neurons? Well, OK, I want to bring in two other ideas. Firstly, the idea that um, in standard neural networks, you use lists of backward connections. So every, every neuron in the system, you want to have the list of all its inputs looking backwards. So you recalculate the state of each neuron using its list of inputs and their activation levels and weights. But an alternative way of doing things is, is to use an event-driven simulator, which has a list of forward connections so that for each neuron, each spike coming in updates the activation levels of all of its targets. Now, we've been playing with these sort of ideas actually for a long time. SpikeNet was uh, originally um, developed back in the 90s by my, with my students. Uh, back in 99, 1999, we were simulating really quite large networks with uh, doing face detection using um, basically spiking neural networks, one spike per neuron and uh, playing around with the weights. And this actually worked. And this was so we're doing multi-scale face detection and localization back in 1999. That's actually why we created SpikeNet technology in 1999. I remember at the time I would I would joke that with Spike that <coughs> with Spike that I can simulate the entire human brain in real time, as long as none of the neurons fires a spike. So um, that sort of that's one key idea, and the other idea is the difference between sequential versus block-based propagation. So sequential propagation is where each spike as it comes in is processed one by one, but you can also uh, group these spikes into blocks. Um, in packets. This is actually what N of M uh, coding does. You, 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 you take uh, uh, M, uh, N spikes together and you process them as a block. So with my colleagues uh, at the ERIT, and in particular Pierre Kukel, who was a, a, a master's student um, this year, uh, uh, we've been using a um, uh, top of the range um, NVIDIA uh, GPU with uh, 10,000 plus cores and 24 gigabytes of memory. And Pierre has been trying out all the different options of Blackwood connections, forward connections, sequential or by block and using either a CPU with 32 cores or the GPU. And some of these applications we've already had JAST learning on uh, in the code. And basically what we've looked at is the performance of this. And uh, uh, to cut the long, uh, long story short, what, what we found out is that the optimum is using the GPU, using forward connectivity and block-based processing. Uh, and specifically um, using 
just this, this GPU, we managed to simulate a, a spiking neural network with a billion neurons, a hundred million input lines, four billion connections, let's say four connections per neuron, and we take a block of one million input spikes, that's one percent of the inputs, and we can we push that through the GPU and process everything in 18 milliseconds, find out which neurons have fired spikes and so on. That corresponds to 2 billion um, synaptic updates every second, which is pretty impressive. And uh, you know, real soon now, I hope we're going to get up to 16 billion neurons rather than 1 billion neurons. Allow recurrent connectivity because spikes in the network can actually be plugged back in as inputs as well and have online just running on, on on this and if we can get that going then we can do all sorts of things like image processing maybe natural language processing uh, and it could potentially be an alternative to the things like gpt3 with a much simpler learning rule rather than using uh, the standard sort of backprop related um, learning we can use the just thing just pick up uh, to wire the neurons up depending on what comes in I just want to stress that you know, this network that we've already done has a hundred million inputs and a billion outputs. So it's like a crossbar array with a huge number of synapses. I mean, it's got a, it's got a hundred million billion synapses here. But of course, most of them aren't connected. But this sort of architecture would be very difficult to simulate using standard methods. I think you know. Um, Steve Ferber, Spinnaker, Intel's Lowy, uh, IBM, True North, and uh, even Brain Chips Akita would, would have a tough job here. And you couldn't build a physical crossbar array to be able to do something this size. So we've got this code already, and the question is what we're going to do with it next. Well, um, for instance, the, the Apple have just recently released, uh, last week actually, the new uh, M1 Max chip, which has got 57 billion transistors, 64 gigabytes of unified memory on chip, 400 gigabytes of bandwidth, and a 512-bit memory bus, etc., etc. And you know, uh, it's going to be interesting to see what, how our algorithms would run on that. We can also use uh, these um, um, cheap um, t four terabyte memory models like this one here from uh, Seagate. Um, uh, it's got uh, amazingly fast uh, sequential reading and writing and you can access a, uh, randomly a, hundred, uh, a million different um, locations in a second. Uh, um, eight terabyte boards are coming available too. Now, four terabytes, if you if you just use this to store connections, even using 32-bit addressing, that's to say uh, with six, you know, four billion possible targets, that's a trillion connections you can store with this. And so I, I seriously think a terabrain system is going to be possible in the near future. So to summarize, Hardware-friendly AI algorithms, well, here are my take-home messages. Firstly, don't use floating-point numbers for activation levels and weights. Use spikes and use binary weights. Don't use rate coding. Use temporal coding and, and use uh, uh, the trick of fixing the percentage of neurons that spike, i.e. N of M coding, because it may, allows you to make very selective neurons very cheaply. Don't use backward lists of, in, of the inputs to neurons. Instead, use the forward list and lists of the connections from, from uh, of the outputs from each neuron, and just propagate those using an event-driven computing strategy. And if you want to get the best from a GPU, uh, process a block of spikes uh, and check to see which neurons have thre reached threshold at the end of that block. Uh, and in those conditions, you actually can do the learning as a separate step. And, uh, you know, basically, you don't need to physically implement synapses using things like crossbar arrays uh, with this very sparse uh, thing. Uh, you just store the lists of connections. And so, you know, the bottom line is I think that simulating neural networks the size of the human brain or even larger could be possible real soon now. And with that, I thank you for your attention.